So, uh, he was born in 1859. Um, that means He's a little bit younger than Royce. Royce was born in 1855, but he lived much longer than Royce. Right? He lived until 1952. <laughs> um, and uh, he's, also, he's about the same age as Adams. Adams was born in 1860, and uh, Du Bois was born in 1868. So, um, so kind of in the middle of this cluster of people we've been going to, but like Du Bois, he lived a long time. <laughs> so, um, and he continued publishing um, um, in his old age. Um, uh, so, so this book is, you know, when it was published in 1930, is kind of like partway through his <laughs> his works. Um, um, he did know Du Bois somewhat, I think. I don't gather that they were especially friendly or anything. Um, he was very close to, to Jane Adams, as I mentioned before. Um, and I think we'd be able to see that his thought is close to hers in some ways also. Um, there also seems to be some influence of Royce. Now, I mean, like, I didn't try to look into this to see whether he um, actually refers to Royce somewhere. In this book, he barely doesn't, basically doesn't refer to um, anyone. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> like, it's just all him talking. <laughs> um, but, uh, um, but there definitely seem to be some allusion, something that seems like allusions to Royce. Anyway, sometimes he uses the term loyalty in the way that Royce uses it. Um, and what else can I say about him? So, I mean, here, like, we're finally intersecting with the official course description. I, I think Emerson was mentioned there, and, um, and I think uh, James is mentioned and Dewey. Um, so, I mean, this is someone who is definitely a philosopher <laughs> um, that is definitely considered a philosopher, considered himself to be a philosopher, among other things. Um, and someone who you definitely would expect to find in a course on American philosophy. Um, Although, to my mind, I have to say, he's not as, I mean, like, I think that is reflected definitely in, like, I found it easier to, to decide what to say about him than some of these other people. <laughs> it is more like, you know, um, um, I don't know. It is more structured the way you expect a philosophy book to be structured or something like that, even though there's plenty of stuff in it about economics and politics and whatever. Um, um, however, having said that, I feel like it's actually not as philosophically subtle or interesting as some of the kind of not quite philosophers or like border, you know, like Du Bois, for example. I mean, um, I, but maybe it's a kind of lack of sympathy with the way of thinking on my part. I think that's part of it. Um, so, I mean, he's, he's one of the two or three main figures that are usually listed when you talk about pragmatism. Sometimes people include Du Bois as a pragmatist too, but I'm not really sure I see that. Um, but, um, right, as Charles Stanley first. William James and Dewey. 
of the big three pragmatists. <laughs> um, um, I'm not sure how clearly that, like, whatever the thesis of pragmatism is, comes out in this particular book. But I do feel like these people have something in common, and it does have something has something to do with whatever the cognitive content of pragmatism is supposed to be. And I feel like it somewhat rubs me the wrong way. <laughs> so, like I said, I might not be the most sympathetic person to lecture on this. Um, but um, but I mean, and like what that is. I mean, like when I read this, I have a feeling of kind of relatedness. <laughs> um, I, I don't know exactly how to explain it. I mean, it's not abstraction because I love abstraction. <laughs> it's uh, um, and it's not like, although it is true. I think I noticed that there aren't a lot of like transition words between the paragraphs. And sentences in this book. I think that gives part of the feeling to the style, right? Like it's, the sense, the paragraphs don't start like however or therefore. It just says something else, <laughs> you know. And so there are philosophers who write that way, but who don't sound like this at all, like Wittgenstein or Nietzsche. Um, not that they sound like each other either, um, but that's part of it. I mean, also of course, like. There's a lot of sentences where the subject is factors <laughs> or something like that, <laughs> right? Like I mean, uh, many factors contribute to the uh, way, like it's, they, and that, that you know goes on and on. And it's like I said, it's not exactly abstraction, right? Because it's not like there's something like abstraction is like Hegel saying being is nothing. <laughs> And, right, and you're uh, like it's hard to understand, um, but it's clear that there's something he's calling being that he's really interested, in, right, and that's why that's the subject of the sentence. Whereas there isn't something that Dewey's calling factors that he's really interested in, right? Like that's not why that's the subject of the sentence. So I mean, so, and but like I said, I have a feeling that this, you know. And I think Peirce and James have something of this in their styles too. And I, I have a feeling that it's something about um, not wanting to give an impression that there's some first principle that we can follow out through steps or something like that, right? I mean, definitely not wanting to sound like Hegel. Um, but, um, That leads to this style that feels that, that leaves me feeling kind of like floating. Like, I'm not sure. I mean, so like you know, it's not because there aren't structured thoughts here. I think you know, like I'm about to to, to start talking about the you know um, his positions and he's like his arguments and whatever, and they're definitely there, and it's just like they're not signaled somehow in the way I'd expect. And like I said, I feel like. Like it's probably not a coincidence that there's. I mean, this like this is what you expect if someone is an interesting philosopher. Right? You expect like whatever difficulties you're have re having reading the text, and even including things that you might think of as stylistic, are actually somehow connected to what they're trying to say. Um, so, but I feel like, like I said, maybe I don't like what they're trying to say, and. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure, but in any case, um, I just wanted to report that feeling, I guess. Um, other than that, I could say, I mean, this is interesting, although again, I don't see a lot of evidence of it, at least not in this book. That So he studied as an undergraduate at the University of Vermont. Um, and as I think I said at the beginning of the course, there was this you know, New England transcendentalism was kind of divided into two schools, the Boston transcendentalists and the Vermont transcendentalists. 
or I guess it's sometimes also called the Burlington philosophy. Um, and the founder of that was James Marsh. Um, and I mean, uh, I, haven't read, I have read some of James Marsh, um, not that much, but it, it's, it's completely different in tone from Emerson or Thoreau. Um, and it's, um, it's more, it's more conservative in some way. It's uh, like, in fact, you know, so he was really involved in introducing Coleridge to America and the Coleridge he was interested in is the Coleridge who, and like, in, if, and when I ever teach 19th century, again, I'll talk about this, this part of Coleridge more, but like, is the Coleridge who claims that the, like, early, reformers in England in the 17th century um, had the right idea about everything, I guess, and that, that they are somehow like saying the same thing as the post-Kantian idealists. <laughs> um, so, um, so like James Marsh arranged to have Coleridge's uh, um, uh, notes for reflection, something for reflection. I don't think it's notes. Anyway, he arranged to have uh, Coleridge's book, which is, you know, I mean, it's like a theology. He arranged to have it published in the US and wrote a long introduction to it um, um, and said that this is what we need to get away from the bad influence of the British empiricists and the Scottish common sense all and their deterministic view of human will and various things, right? So that was James Marsh. Um, uh, James Marsh wasn't still there when um, Dewey was, but James Marsh had this student, um, John Tory, Joseph Tory, uh, who continued his position at the University of Vermont. And Joseph Torrey's nephew, and also son-in-law, because he married his own first cousin, was H.A.P. Uh, Torrey, who I saw in some random place on the internet that apparently was referred to as Happy Torrey. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. But anyway, so Dewey studied with him as, uh, you know, while he was an undergraduate at the University of Vermont. And then afterwards, he like studied privately with, with him for a while before he went into grad school. Um, and he did report later that Coleridge was an important influence. You know, so, and, and also Cox. So, um, you know, uh, Tory was. I mean, Colder is very interested in Kant, and all these people are very interested in Kant, and Dewey's first two publications were about Kant. So, like, these are all, you know, like, interesting facts about early influences on him. Again, I don't see a lot of them in this book. But there's, you know, it seems a lot less Kantian, let alone, you know, Hegelian or something than uh, Royce, for example. But perhaps I'm probably I'm missing something. Probably there's something that he's exactly inverted. Of. <laughs> um, anyway, so that's worth thinking about. But again, I don't know what to do with it. Uh, um, he does sometimes mention Emerson favorably, and um, he wrote an essay about Emerson. That I keep meaning to read, but I haven't had time. It's called uh, something like Emerson, Philosopher of Democracy. Um, but like I said, Emerson is a Boston transcendentalist, and James Marsh didn't think very highly of him. Um, Okay, so that's like his his background. He was, I mean, as for what kind of 
stuff he was interested in. I think, you know, I mean, um, this book is a pretty good sample of it, I, but, uh, you know, he's especially known for his work on education. Um, it does come up in this book more, more in the next reading, um, but, um, uh, but, you know, this is a this is, goes in a somewhat different direction, but it's you know I mean you can definitely see how it's connected with his interest in education. Um, okay, now like as far as this book, um, which I'm not hundred percent sure was the best book to read for this course. I just like he he was he wrote a lot of books. <laughs> um, he wrote a lot of stuff. Um, you know, and I did not go through all of that and try to pick the best one, but, um, but uh, still looking at some other likely suspects, I, I felt like this was probably the, the most relevant to this course. It was published in 1930. Um, Published in 1930, like the um, uh, the Du Bois we've been reading, it was in this case. It was all, it was based on a series of articles he published in the New Republic in 1929 to 1930. Um, he, like, just, and this is relevant to what happens in the book, he kind of just manages to register the beginning of the Great Depression. Like, the earliest one is from April 1929, so it's before the stock market crash. Um, but the later ones, he's, he's starting to talk about it, but it's really not clear what's going to happen to that. I think, and, you know, Hoover is still in power, still, still in office, I should say, in power. Hoover is, is, is still in office, right? The FBI was elected in 1932. Um, and, uh, um, and it's, you know, still not clear that it's going to be the Great Depression. <laughs> um, Um, and it's, I mean, that's relevant, I think, because, you know, a lot of the things he says about the political situation and the economic situation, like, wouldn't exactly be true anymore, in, you know, a year or two after. Um, So, and before talking about what is in the book, I just wanted to, to stop for a second to say what's not in the book. Ray, um, the problem of the color line has disappeared. <laughs> right? We're just not talking about that at all. Um, and it's ob not obviously because the problem disappeared in, in the world, right? I mean, you know, lynching had fallen off somewhat, but like a little bit of lynching is still a lot. <laughs> it's still a big deal. Um, and uh, and of course, you know, Jim Crow continued, not to mention all the kinds of insults that Du Bois talks about. And like, you know, um, as we know, it kind of like always continued. Right? <laughs> we still have. So, um, but um, but Dewey um, is not the the problem. The fundamental problems he thinks we need to solve as a society just don't like go near that. Even the pro the issue about the new immigrants that we saw Adams and Royce so worried about, and that Du Bois also alludes to, um, is like. Um, doesn't seem to be interested in that. Now, partly it's because immigration was had been greatly just restricted <laughs> between 1920 and 1930. Um, so uh, I think it was the Immigration Act of 1924 
um, they, they put in place a policy to try to keep the ethnic balance of the U.S. as of 1920, of the white American population as of 1920, to keep it constant, right? So they tabulated like how many Italians and how many Yugoslavians and whatever there were and in 1920, and the policy, the immigration policy was to try to keep that constant. Um, so that obviously put a stop to a huge wave of immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe that Adams and Royce are talking about. Um, however, again, it's uh, not like there were no issues about that after 1924, um, but that's not what he's interested in. The, you know, what he is interested in, the main problem that American society has to face has to do with um, the advent of industrial civilization. Um, and in particular, somehow the interaction of that industrial civilization with the devotion to money. Right, so like, as he says, this is in chapter two on page 15. Um, our materialism, now, I mean, remember that in Declare, there were kind of two different things that were, been, I think she actually may have called them both materialism, but anyway, that you could both call materialism, but it wasn't clear how they fit together. So one thing is like a philosophical doctrine that everything is made out of matter, <laughs> right? And, it, and another really different thing is um, like, devoting all your effort to obtaining material possessions. Um, so in, in Dewey, although he doesn't put it this way, or using the term materialism, um, those two things are gonna turn out to be actually in opposition to each other. <laughs> um, but so here he's using materialism in the second sense, okay? Right, our materialism. So he doesn't mean our lack of belief in spirit. Right, he means, as you can tell from the continuation of the quote, our devotion to money making and to having a good time are not things by themselves. They are the product of the fact that we live in a money culture, of the fact that our technique and technology. He makes this distinction between technique and technology a lot. And I'm not sure what he's including under one and what he's including under the other. Um, except that I guess technique is supposed to be broader and encompass things that don't involve like machines. Um, like the techniques of public relations, stuff like that, I think is what he's thinking of. So anyway, the fact that our technique and technology are controlled by interest in private profit, there lies the serious and fundamental defect of our civilization, the source of the secondary and induced evils to which so much attention is given, right? So the fundamental problem in our situation is um, the, control, the control of um, technique and technology by the dominant um, profit-seeking culture. Um, and I guess, you know, so I introduced it that way to, you know, just to show how, like how not obvious it is that that's the fundamental problem. But from his point of view, that's the fundamental problem. So, um, and as you can tell from the title, uh, Dewey understands what's bad about that situation. Um, so like, 
in other words, the cause of the badness is the fact that industry is under the control of um, the money-making culture. Um, but the, what the bad thing that gives rise to is some kind of problem about individualism. Now, um, it's not clear exactly what individualism I mean, this, you know, I mean, like this, you could say in general, not just about this book, about the whole course, right? But it's not, you know, people keep talking about individualism. And I mean, they often, as Dewey does, distinguish between different kinds of individualism. But um, even on a broader level, it's not clear that they're always talking about the same thing. Like, so for example, it's not clear that Dewey, what Dewey is calling individualism is exactly like maps onto what Royce calls individualism. Um, so like, it means that there's a problem about individualism, about our form of individualism or something like that. I mean, what it certainly means is something like that individuals, that is like people, right? But individuals are as such in a bad state. Um, and they should be in a good state. And the good state they should be in something called stable, um, integrated, I think is the most common word for what is needed here or like in harmony with their society. This is the state that individuals should be in, but in our situation, they're not. And I mean, he, he agrees completely with Royce. And this is like the, the place where it almost seems like maybe he's alluding to Royce or building on Royce, that um, that individuals can't be in this good state um, unless they're attached to something social in the right way. Um, Right, like so the chap this is in chapter four, page twenty-six. Stability of individuality. See, this is another this is an example of one of these sentences, right? The subject is stability. <laughs> stability of individuality is dependent upon stable objects to which allegiance firmly attaches itself. Um Right, so that, I mean, assuming that allegiance is basically the same thing as loyalty, that could be a quote from Brooks. In order to, to be yourself, to be an individual, you need allegiance to something. And without it, you're unstable or disunited or non-integrated. Um, and sometimes Dewey actually says loyalty. But like on the same page, uh, page 26, right above that, it says, the significant thing is that the loyalties which once held individuals, which gave them support, direction, and unity of outlook on life have well nigh disappeared. Right, so, um, like, so, so far we're very close to Royce, except it's not so clear that the thing that you need to be attached to is a, is a cause in Royce's sense. Seems like it's a little bit different. So, like the, on the next page, um, I don't know if you, page twenty-seven. Assured and integrated individuality is the project product of definite social relationships and publicly acknowledged functions. Right, so that now that doesn't sound exactly like. It. I mean, of course, 
it's true that the social order providing a function is what allowed um, um, <laughs> Lethal, <laughs> William Lethal, that was his name, the Speaker of the House, right? Like, he, you know, he, like the existence of that function is what allowed him to attach himself to a cause. Um, but, um, um, but the emphasis here seems to be on like being assigned a function, not in like, like um, choosing a function for yourself. And I think that's a real difference in emphasis between him and Royce. Um, in, I mean, yeah, it sounds like it's like like that's at least compatible with um, it's compatible with the idea that the social order that that, that you 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 achieve your attachment by what Royce calls tradition, right? That the social order, uh, you know, like provides. Uh, functions and social relationships that you can kind of um, find yourself in. Um, and, you know, like, because of that, and I think this is the place where we're getting closer to Adam's, like because of that, it's <clears throat> necessary that um, there's some kind of consensus in the society about what functions are available. I think that's what publicly acknowledged function means, right? So, like uh, the the situation that um Royce talks about where the you know where the royalists see the situation one way and the parliamentary people see the situation a different way right like so so from like from the king's point of view um he's talking to a subject whereas from Lentil's point of view um he's uh um, being talked to as the representative of an independent um, uh, governmental body that has its own privileges that the king can't infringe on. So, like that type of situation, I think is one that that I mean, um, Royce seems to think is fine for providing opportunities for loyalty. Whereas I feel like Dewey would say that society is out of harmony. Um, so, I mean, I know because this is just a few sentences after the thing I just read, talking about the quote unquote captains of finance and industry. Until there is some consensus of belief as to the meaning of finance and industry and civilization as a whole, they cannot be captains of their own souls, their beliefs and aims, right? So, so like the consequence is the consequence that Royce warns against, that you, if you don't, if you're not attached to something social, that you just find yourself in a chaos of different um, motivations and beliefs and whatever, and there's no way to unify it. But the, like what's required to help that in this case, it's something like much bigger, it seems like. There has to be a consensus of belief as to the meaning of finance and industry and civilization as a whole. And because there isn't, um, even though these captains of industry are like, um, they are attached to a cause. It may not be the cause that, that Royce would advise them to attach themselves to. But that's a separate issue, right? Because, but remember, Royce says, even if it's a bad cause, 
it's it serves this purpose for the individual of you know letting them unify themselves. So like if they're if they're attached to the cause of making you know Standard Oil make a lot of money or something, um, and and are really loyal to it. Uh, I mean, I guess you could question: Are they really loyal to it? This is one of the problems with joint stock corporations, right? It's not it, Adam Smith actually, you know, uh, said that that uh, that would never be a good structure for a business <laughs> for, for this reason that the the people running it are not necessarily loyal to the corporation; they have their own interests. Um, but assuming that the captains of finance and industry are loyal to the purposes of making money for their corporation, then according to Royce, that would it might be the wrong choice of cause, but it would serve the purpose of having a cause. Um, but um, but according to Dewey, that cause is or, or that attachment is not sufficient as long as um, there's no consensus as to what the what its importance is, what its significance is, something like that. He said. What he says here is meaning, the meaning of finance and industry. I'm not sure exactly how to understand that. Um, more than, it's different than just purpose, I guess. Um, or it's certainly different than like utility. Right? Like we might all agree that finance and industry are useful. I mean, we don't all agree, but we might all agree that finance and industry are useful, but it doesn't seem like that would satisfy what Dewey is asking for. Like, we have to understand, I think it's like this, it's the consensus. The consensus, remember, I made the point uh, um, about um, consent versus uh, consensus, like having to do with everyone kind of feeling together, having the same sense. Like uh, um, um, that, that's like definitely some, that's something about how Adams had understood consent of the government. Um, but at least when consent of the government, when, when you have a real democracy, that's not merely a contrivance for government, right? So it seems like like Dewey is, is saying that we need something like that. We need to um, agree on how finance and industry express the civilization. Um, Okay, so like that's that's um, one sense in that there's a problem about individualism is that there's a problem for individuals that they don't know how to unify to make themselves into individuals. Um, but just saying that there's a problem for individuals doesn't clearly translate into um, being an individualist. And like, this is where Dewey and Royce seem to come apart more, right? Like, so when, when Royce says that, when Royce says that he's individualist, he means that, um, Not the point that individuals are in trouble if they don't have loyalty. That's actually the thing that seems to threaten individuals, right? So individualism means something else. Individualism means, um, and for Royce, it means um, something about what he called autonomy. 
Right. So and so when Rice says that my philosophy of loyalty is an individualistic philosophy of loyalty, he means that um, uh, although I think that individuals require loyalty to be individuals, I also think that individuals uh, require autonomy. I agree with my like with my would-be opponents. Yeah, in the end, it ends up saying they don't really oppose me, right? But I agree with my would-be opponents that if loyalty is opposed to autonomy, it would be a bad thing. Now, I mean, there's something like that in Dewey here. So I think there is a sense in which he's an individualist, and in which he's saying that the problem for individuals is that we don't have the right kind of individualism. But it doesn't seem to be so much about autonomy. Um, I mean, I think like the thing that um, seems to be opposed to individualism, and that um, that you might worry that that like an opponent of of Dewey's might worry that he's um, somehow abetting is I think it's what he calls standardization. Right, so standardization is um, supposed to be part of what the current European critics think is bad about American. Um, um, they, they think it's bad and they fear it. It's what they fear about America. The Europeans are afraid of America. Um, I think, like, um, even in 1920, although, although as I said, that, and as Dewey says, the First World War is kind of a turning point. Um, that probably wouldn't be a main way you would you would characterize the relationship between America and Europe. I think not. I mean, I get that. Did you say that royalists were afraid of American republicanism? I don't know. But that's not what Dewey's talking about anyway, right? So Europeans are afraid of America. Now, I mean, it's the, the fear is cultural, right? I mean, it's not like directly military, like the US is gonna invade Europe, but the fact that the US did invade Europe in World War One, I, I mean, that is like in alliance with various European countries, right? But still, the fact that uh, the US now has invaded Europe um, is, according to Dewey himself, is somehow um, related to this, right? This is, this is the very beginning of chapter two, America by formula. I'm not sure what why it's called by formula. Is it like these are formulaic criticisms that Europeans make of Americanness, maybe? I'm not sure. But anyway, right near, near the very beginning of that chapter, the war and its consequences may not have produced in our own country a consciousness of quote Americanism as a distinctive mode of civilization, but they have definitely had that effect among the intellectual elite of Europe. Right? They like so like somehow like being in having their minds focused on America because of what happened during the war has caused them to notice, oh, there's something really scary about this. And like, and so, I mean, this is only part of the way he characterizes it, but this is the part I'm gonna talk about that, um, that what they fear and um, object to in Americanness is standardization. Um, So it seems like standardization is a kind of um, uniformity. Like America, Americans are somehow um, all the same as each other. They're conformist. 
Um, um, it's so like this worry is. I mean, how is it? How is it related to the worry about lack of autonomy that Royce is talking about? It's, I mean, it's related to it somehow, but they're not exactly the same thing. Yes. Um, it seems to me that he wasn't necessarily concerned about standardization alone. He often puts it like in this grouping of standardization, uh, mechanization, and externalization. And it's not necessarily any of those things which are the problem, but that the all of them get mixed together in this um, kind of hidden um, pressure that exists um, under the guise of the whole individuals. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, you know, I, I think what you're saying is right in terms of do the how Dewey is going to analyze this, right? But right, but, but right now I'm talking about like what the what the fear that his critics are going to express is, okay. right? So um, you know, like what is it that the Europeans are afraid of? As a, you know, like is it the same as what Royce's earnest young son of Russian immigrants was afraid of when Royce started talking about loyalty, and like. At, as, a, as a, what I was saying is, it's 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 somehow related, and they're both some somehow related to you know to Emerson and Thoreau's worries about conformity and consistency. But they, you know, it's not exactly the same thing. You know, what we're worried about here is not that people are um, oppressed and unable to make choices for themselves. We're worried that they don't want to make choices for themselves, or not even that exactly, it's just that they all make the same choice. <laughs> um, now, I mean, um, um, so as you say, Dewey is going to give his going to give his analysis of what it is that they're reacting to and why it's characteristic of industrial. Society in this bad phase that it's in, um, but um, but I guess you know the reason I'm and I'm about to talk about that. But the but the reason I'm introducing it here now is to say that you know so like in what sense is Dewey an individualist? He's an individualist in the sense that he agrees that this would be bad, <laughs> right? That this kind of uniformity is bad. That we need originality and uniqueness. That's those are the terms that he um, like tends to oppose to this. So um, again, you might think that originality and uniqueness go together with autonomy, but they're not exactly the same thing. They they wouldn't necessarily go together. Um, so the worry about that that our situation is suppressing individualism and the response that you know and this is sort of the plot of the book the response that well um, that's why we need a new individual right uh, that I mean the um, the worry is a worry that it will that it's going to suppress originality and uniqueness. That it's going to make everyone into a copy of everyone. Um, um, and and I'm, I'm going to start talking about what Yui says about this, but just one more thing that like. Um, This particular worry must seem strange to Du Bois, <laughs> right? That the worry is that that all Americans are going to be the same as each other. Um, you know, uh, America has set up this caste system, and it's like gone to great effort to make sure that people are not the same as each other, not in a good way, of course, right? But it, but it's not standardization. 
Um, so, like again, I think that shows that you know how how much the focus here has moved off what the things that the voice is talking about. Um, like why that is, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, it's for sure not because Dewey is racist. You know, like as, um, the one thing I did find on the web is is like uh, Du Bois. Uh, asking Dewey to write an essay for an issue of the crisis and write like um, it's you know so like it's it's not because Dewey is is racist but it is yeah somehow like I think even more than in some of the other people we just read besides Du Bois like a feeling that that was the problem of the nineteenth century. Right, you know, that was the problem that caused the Civil War. Yeah. I mean, also, maybe, and I'd probably have been actively thought this if you said it, but I, I think looking at it in terms of if um, the lower classes, previously enslaved people, are going to achieve true equality, then the like, being forced through the mold of standardization is not the way to achieve it. Yeah, uh, no, I mean, and I guess I should have said more. Not only is not Dewey is not is Dewey not a racist, but I think yeah that if you had asked him, isn't this a problem? He would say yes, it's a problem, but he would say it's somehow actually in the version that exists now is like derived from this problem. It's not like uh, an after effect of slavery or something, right? But it's a problem about our class system and whatever. And if, like if that could be solved. Um, this race hatred would dissipate. That's probably what he thought, I guess. But the point is, but as you say, he's you know whatever it is in fact, he, he he thinks he's not he's not talking. So like I, again, I think if you asked him, he would have something to say about it. But it's it, it's you know in his um, I think this is in the reading for next time that when he he says. That he doesn't believe in a hierarchy of values, but he does believe in a hierarchy of problems. That some problems are more fundamental than other problems. Um, so um, it, it it seems that you know, although he thinks that's a problem, he doesn't place it to on too fundamental a level in his hierarchy of problems. Um, and you know. Um, uh, With, even within the black community, there were, right in this time there were debates about it, right like Marxists would would you know would say that no like the racial problems are just a reflex of under underlying um, economic problems and they you know and uh, and obviously Du Bois is on the other side of that but so like it's. Um, um, I feel like, but although I guess, I mean, there's still debates about this. So maybe I shouldn't say that. I feel like, in light of everything that's happened since, it, it, it seems like Du Bois was on the right side of that. But, but like I said, maybe um, that case isn't really close. But so, in any case, so, um, the, right. So, this is what he's worried about. Everyone is coming out the same. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, that is, that's what he's, that's the menace to individuality that he's worried about. He's worried about other things too. But this is the, this is the threat to individuality. And it's, you know, like a response to a threat to individuality that makes him not just concerned about individuals, which like individuals are just people, right? So of course they're concerned about individuals, but right? it makes him, it makes him an individualist makes him want a form of individualism. So, and so what, what Dewey argues about this standardization is that, um, and I think this is similar to what you were saying, what you were just saying, that um, 
I mean, I don't know exactly how to put it. I want to say it isn't the uniformity as such that's bad. Although, I mean, I think that's a correct expression of what he's saying, although I also think that he doesn't think the uniformity will persist if the problem is solved, right? So, but um, but he's, but I think he thinks it's like, the, it's not the uniformity as such that's bad, but it's the, it's the deadening external way that the uniformity is being enforced. Um, pretty much exactly about on page 43. Yeah, okay. I was going to read from page 41, but I'm sure it's on page 43. <laughs> um, where he says, um, um, if his ideas, that is the individual's ideas, if his ideas and beliefs are not the spontaneous function of the communal life in which he shares, a seeming consensus will be secured as a substitute by artificial and mechanical means. Right? So that is the point is that because we don't have this consensus, and like we don't, uh, um, we haven't agreed on what the meaning of our, our fundamental institutions um, are. Um, we uh, um, we try to hobble along, hobble along without it by imposing an external consensus. Is, I mean, is this similar to what you were saying, or that it's the right? It's the standardization yeah. and the externalization and the mechanization. I mean, he, he, I think rephrases the same point about conformity probably like five or six times. Which yeah, which on like one on page 41, one on page 42, and one on page 43. And I just happen to like one on the test. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, which is the one on page 43? Uh, conformity is enduringly uh, important or something um, when it comes out of a spontaneous communal situation. Um, but when it uh, is artificially induced, it is this uh, symptom of an inner void. Yeah. So it's, I mean, yeah, so like conformity, I mean, maybe that is a better quote actually, because it shows something that my quote doesn't, namely the, I, like, so I don't think this is the same as uniformity. Um, but right, I was saying that the uniformity itself is not bad, but but like he's, in the end, he seems to say that if we have a new form of individualism, there won't be uniformity, there'll be originality and uniqueness. But I think he thinks there will be conformity. And the conformity, I guess, because I guess the difference is something like the conformity expresses itself in people being in relationships with each other where they like complement each other, something like that. Um, so, I mean, so standardization is the result of trying to get conformity by external means, which produces uniformity. It, um, and so like produces a kind of conformity where there's no room for individuality and they, or I'm uh, sorry, for create, Originality and uniqueness. Um, right, or here, this is also on page forty one. Um, the standardization is the plural. But one might almost say that one of the reasons it is deplorable is because it does not go deep. It goes <laughs> far enough to affect <laughs> the original quality of thought, but not far enough to achieve enduring unity. So it's so I mean it's the standardization is bad for because it's external. Right, but I say there's, there's two bad things about it being external. One is that it suppresses original thoughts, but the other is that it doesn't even achieve the aim for which we want it. 
right? That its result is unstable. Um, that this kind of like externally imposed uniformity can't really substitute for a true for true unity. Um, I think you know that's why this is like it's a little complicated to explain what's going on here. It's you know it's he agrees that the uniformity itself is as such is is bad, but um, but it's it's a bad thing that they're because of a worse. <laughs> And the worst thing is the lack of true unity. Um, and so, like, okay, so, so, how do we end up in this situation where we have a lack of true unity and we're trying to substitute externally imposed? uniformity for it. Um, so I, as, like, as we already know, it has something to do with the money culture. But, so the diagnosis has something to do with the money culture, but it's actually, it's pretty complicated. Um, so because first of all, the money culture, um, The money culture itself is do we conceive of as something that's old? Right? Like he doesn't say, you know, um, I mean, he does say this, but it, but but it, as I said, it's complicated. So, like he does say, you know, in the revolutionary period, people were idealistic, and then the money culture took over, right? But he doesn't think that money culture is something that first arose. Rather, the money culture is like an old thing that reasserted itself. Um, so it's a. Um, It's a like pre or even anti American element. So, right, he describes the distinctively American tradition. This is on page eight. As um, it contain, contains in itself the ideal of equality of opportunity and of freedom for all. Um, without regard to birth and status as a condition for the effective realization, oh, sorry, equality of opportunity, that's one thing. And second thing, freedom for all without regard to birth and, and status as a condition for the effective realization of that equality. So that was the, that's the um, American tradition, the traditionally American idea. But um, so what happened was, so like there's always been a money culture. Money culture is going on. The um, like American ideal asserts itself in some way against them. But then we get industrialization. And industrialization puts a, suddenly puts a huge amount of power in the hands of the money culture. This is um, page nine, the end of chapter one. Meanwhile, our institutions embody another and older tradition. Industry and business conducted for money profit are nothing new. They are not the product of our own age and culture. They come to us from a long past, but the invention of the machine has given them a power and scope they never had in the past from which they derived. So, um, in this older money culture tradition, and this part like seems, Almost paradoxical to understand where he's coming from. 
this is what I this is what I was saying about the two different meanings of materialism and how they actually go against each other. The older tradition, Dewey sees as rooted in a non-materialist, like dualist view about human beings. Right? So obviously the money culture is the culture of materialism in the sense of like putting all your effort towards gaining material possessions. But um, but uh, Dewey says that it's not materialist in that more like metaphysical sense. On the contrary, it's based in dualism. Um, right, so like this is chapter two, page 16. Um, the old European tradition With its disregard for the body, material things, and practical concerns, he says, um, so I'll just read this whole sentence. That if, so, 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 so first he mentions the old European tradition with its disregard for the body, material things, and practical concerns. And then he says, the development of the American type in the sense of the critics is an expression of the fact that we have retained this tradition and the economic system of private gain on which it is based. While at the same time, we have made an independent development of industry and technology that is nothing short of revolution. Right? So this old time money culture is a result of a dualistic view about humans and a, and a, and a deprecation of the material part in favor of the spiritual part. Um, and, you know, so how does that make sense? Like, you might think, um, if you're deprecating the material, then you should say, don't work for money, work for spiritual enlightenment, something like that. But I think the idea is that like the moral implications of work and employment for private gain are actually that you should suppress your needs as much as possible, right? There, so they, the, so the, the old time money culture is connected with the values of thrift, with the value of thrift and with the value for employers of pay, paying low wages, which is basically a form of thrift. For the employer, right? Like, don't pay more than you have to. Um, and it's like, I I assume again he doesn't like. It's even more than right. Remember, Adams like quoted people and didn't say who they were. You had to like Google to find out who they were. To <laughs> say a wise man once said, you know, and what he expected her readers to do in a time when there was no Google, I don't know. <laughs> Right. But in any case, but Dewey doesn't even do that right. It's just him the whole time. I, I mean, I don't know, I don't know if that's a hundred percent true, but that's definitely my impression that he doesn't he doesn't mention specific opponents, predecessors, like there's like one guy that he uses to characterize the European view. Oh, right, right. And then, for Brian Spells. Yeah. And, and then one other guy for others who he yeah. cites as like synthesizing the the like original pioneer spirit of American. Oh yeah. And he mentions kind of link too. I so yeah, I guess I am being too uh I am uh exaggerating this. But he doesn't mention other people a lot. <laughs> um, so, like, and among the other people that he doesn't mention is Max Weber. But um, I'm going to assume that this way of thinking about the, or I'm going to guess that this way of thinking about the relationship to the money culture and um, 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 this kind of valuing of spirit over matter is like is based on Weber's ideas. In, uh, so uh, Protestantism 
or no, sorry, uh, capitalism and the Protestant work ethic it was it was first published in English in 1930, but I assume that Dewey read it in German before that. Um, and right, I mean that's that's a big part of Faber's point there that you know. Um, Paradoxically, the, the underpinnings of capitalism are a like Protestant worldview in which you uh, um, are not supposed to like value material things, <laughs> but therefore it turns out what you do is work constantly <laughs> to make money and save. <laughs> um. So, um, um, okay. else about it again. Yeah, thought about it, but I didn't tell him I said he was so let's start with the end of Oh, well. Maybe we'll come back later. Um, so, um, Okay, so this tradition reasserts itself because of industrialization. Um, however, right, because the machine has been put in the hands of, right, like, so the people who are really thrifty and whatever have now, like, uh, managed to buy factories and now they're really rich. <laughs> uh, so, um, um, so like this culture has become dominant, but meanwhile, the, that kind of dualistic um, Puritan personality, that kind of individuality um, no longer makes sense. So as I said, the, the, the diagnosis is really complicated. There's a lot of moving parts. There's a difference between this money culture and this American ideal, but there's also the difference between the way that this money culture was in harmony with um, with what it demanded from individuals in its old state, but now is not. And um, um, it's not because um, In the new corporate situation, um, individual thrift is insignificant, right? As Dewey says, it's of course it's still true that we need like that we need to build up capital to do, this. but that's not going to be done by individuals. Now. And in fact, what does the individual need to do? So basically, like the duty the individual is to spend. Right, without without individual spending, this system won't work. Um, and he also says, of course, the employers are going to realize the same thing that what they need to do is pay high wages. Right, so what he's talking about is um, is or is part of what's sometimes known as Fordism. Right, like Henry Ford, you know, said he was going to pay his workers enough that they could afford to buy his cars. That was, you know, um, that's that that's the thought here, but that, that's the intelligent employers will realize that to be thrifty and pay low wages is self-defeating enough. Um, now like um Uh, somehow that insight maybe didn't continue or it didn't continue to be true up till now. It's not, it's, it's, it's not clear. I don't know. I'm not, but in any case, um, Dewey's, you know, this is the, the latest industrial thinking of the time, right? This is like Henry Ford and Dewey is saying that this shows to what extent but 
the individual values. I don't think he uses the term value. We shouldn't we should be careful about that term. But um, but anyway, like um, the the picture of the individual that this culture includes is actually um, completely out of step with what it what what it requires and, and encourages in the current situation. Um, in chapter six, Dewey is going to criticize Marx for not realizing that this would happen. Um, and I know, like Fordism, I don't know a lot about like Marx's later Marxist theory, but I know Fordism is a big topic. <laughs> Try to explain that in Marx's terms. Um, so, in any case. Um, uh, so, so that's how we ended up with this out of step situation. Individuals are like, um, like individual initiative would consist in being thrifty and working hard and saving up your money. But um, the new situation doesn't encourage or reward that, but it doesn't provide anything else for individual initiative to do. Right? Because, like, if you know, I mean, that you can spend money on stuff you want, but, um, but if you want to achieve something as an individual and you're a worker in one of these big factories, there isn't anything. Um, um, now, like, obviously, I'll come back to try to explain what Dewey thinks we can do about this or whatever. But before that, I would just want to point out I mean, and Dewey is explicit about this to make this story work. Um, you have to understand um, to make this story work. Um, no, can it can you tell it a different way and still have it work without this? Anyway, this story works for Dewey because. He says that industrialization itself is not a product of the money culture. It's, it's neat, so it's neither cause nor effect of the money culture. It's something that comes from like off, you know, comes out of the blue, and suddenly the money culture is able to take advantage of it and become very powerful. But it's not like some a natural effect of the money culture. Um, let alone cause of it. I mean, it's definitely not a cause of it because he's saying the money culture creates it. Um, and so where did industrialization come from? Um, and he says this, you know, again, they probably are, probably he says this a number of times and I could, they could quote another one of them, but this is on chapter five and page 38. As if machines were made by the desire for money profit, not by impersonal science. Right? So the advance of technology, Dewey says, is made by science. Um, so um, it's not made by anything that's happening in our culture. It's made by impersonal science. Uh, I mean, of course, science is ultimately something that's happening in our culture, but the point is, it's not like an outgrowth of um, um, the ideals that we have, the values, again, we should be careful about that word, that we have, this you should be careful about the world ideal as well, but um, that 
um, it comes from somewhere else. And that's why I think he's um, he's able to portray it. Like that's why it's able to knock us out of equilibrium. Mm -hmm. Right? Like if industrialization were the product of the money culture, and like forget about this for a second, although we shouldn't forget about this in the years that it's there, but, but forget about this traditional American ideal for a second. So if industrialization were a product of the money culture, then the you know the money culture's like um, picture of the individual would change in step with its like producing this new form. Um, but instead, it comes from somewhere else, and that's why he says this is also chapter five, page forty-six. The machine took us unawares and unprepared. Instead of forming new purposes to con uh, new purposes commensurate with its potentialities, we accordingly tried to make it the servant of aims that were expressive of an age when mastery of natural energies on any large scale was the fantasy of magic. Right. So, like here came this industrialization out of nowhere, brought made possible by science. Um, we didn't know what to do with this. And so, uh, like, we, we, that is, those of us who were, I mean, because again, we have to somehow bring this back in at some point, but those of us who were devo devoted to the money culture already um, said, well, I have a use for that and make lots of money. <laughs> Um, and because it happened suddenly that way and took us unawares, that's why we ended up in this like disequilibrium situation. Um, in chapter six, Dewey is also going to criticize Marx for not understanding that, for not understanding that science produces technology. Um, Possibly, I'm saying something. I mean, in some sense, I'm always doing this, but now even more than usual, I'm saying something that I don't really know a lot about. <laughs> I'm saying something about something I don't really know a lot about. I have a feeling that maybe um, that Lenin, to some extent, agreed with Dewey about that. That's one of the adjustments in Marxism, but I'm not sure. But in any case, uh, I, I think. Also, that for example, Du Bois doesn't agree with that. Um, du Bois, at least in some places, Du Bois hints, and I think that this is a theory that continues to be maybe has increased popularity today. That industrialization in Britain was brought on by the um, concentration of capital due to the slave trade. Um, so like, um, which of these you think is right? That probably, first of all, it probably depends on exactly what phase of industrialization you're focusing on. I mean, some of the things that happened did, definitely did not involve pre existing scientific theories. It's just like people fooling around with stuff. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, and you can say that could have happened 300 years earlier. Why did it happen? That could have happened in ancient Rome. Why did it happen in Britain in the 19th century and not somewhere else in the 19th century? Um, and um, um, so if you're focused on that type of thing, you would say, well, it must be something about the change in um, structure of British society. That provided new incentives for science. Whereas, if you focused on other types of developments where maybe the scientific theory preceded the industrial use, you might say, well, it happened then because science had advanced. And, um, you know, like I said, this, this, is, I, this is an ongoing debate. This is almost like a debate between Popper and Kuhn. Um, so, uh, um, and continues after that. 
Um, but so anyway, this is the side Dewey is taking. He's saying that industrialization was uh, it happened what it did because of the you know progress of science. Um, So like all of this, this is a much more complicated diagnosis of what's wrong about the money culture than like uh, declare us, for example. Um, like, I don't know if because it's more complicated, it's better, but it's much more complicated. And, and in fact, as I, as I said to begin with, he's bringing out the fact, according to him, that like um, there's really, there's three different things here, which um, none of which exactly go together. You know, one is materialism in the sense of thinking that everything is made out of matter. Another is materialism in the sense of devoting your life to thriftily building up your savings and working in car and whatever. And the third thing is, um, like saying, I love hats, big hats with ribbons, right? Like that third thing Dewey is saying is a result of um, like this individual losing their way once this ideal of thrift no longer makes sense. What do you want now? Hats, <laughs> right? And I mean, that's what the system needs you to want. At least according to, I mean, this again may be more complicated, but at least according to Dewey, you know, the big problem that industries face is overproduction. Um, they have too much capital, but they don't know what to do with that. They make too many hats and there's no one to buy them. Um, so, um, so that I love hats thing is like a, you know, which in declare just looks like a expression of kind of age old human greediness. In Dewey, he's it's like he's diagnosing that it's a result of a particular situation. Um, again, I don't know if he's right about that, but there's uh, um, there's an issue there. <laughs> All right. So, um, okay, so like that's the whole story, I think, of how we ended up in this bad place. Um, it turns out, therefore, that there's actually, we say individualism old and new, there's actually kind of two old forms of individualism and one new one that we don't have yet. Right, I mean, there's this old form of individualism, the kind that was promoted by the old time money culture, and it was in harmony with the old time money culture. By the way, this is also why you know, this is too much of a regression. Now, I was going to say something about Adam Smith. Well, I'll say it. You know, Adam Smith says. You, you like you might think the kind of invisible hand idea is that everyone in doing what's best for themselves does what's best for society. But Adam Smith says actually the people who are spending all their time trying to make money are not really doing what's best for themselves. So it's not going to make them happy. And he says it's you know lucky for the rest of us that they're deluded. <laughs> he says in wealth of nature. Right. So anyway. Um, but getting back to Dewey, right? So there's so it seems like you know there's there's this old time money culture individualism, but there's also the classic American ideal of individualism, right? Which has to do with equality of opportunity for all individuals and the freedom that's necessary to uh, um, establish that equality, and. I mean, it seems like the new situation is somehow in a bad way, like um, but I, 
I can't figure out how to exactly how the pieces are still together, go together. But the new situation is somehow in a bad way, like wrecking and perverting both of these older forms of humanism. Um, Ray says, instead of the development of individualities, or they say, the spiritual factor of our tradition, equal opportunity and free association and intercommunication is obscured and crowded out. Instead of the development of individualities, which is prophetically set forth, there is a perversion of a whole ideal of individualism to conform to the practices of, of a pecuniary culture. So it's like, you know, again, I don't think he thinks that the old time pecuniary culture was bad, although it kind of sounds like it here. But I think he thinks the old time pecuniary, pecuniary culture was fine in its circumstances. Um, or at least maybe not completely fine, but like not so bad. It wasn't in our bad situation. And this new ideal prophetically proclaimed, proclaimed a new kind of individual. But because of this weird thing that happened, the like the um, attempt to carry out the prophecy of the new individualism in this situation ends up um, instead imposing a perverted and non-working version of this old individualism. And like, I mean, just to fill in like some concrete detail there. Right, I mean, he's talking about, you know, um, libertarianism, right? But he's talking about the, the people who own the industry saying in the name of equality of opportunity and freedom, don't take our, our industry away. Let us do what we want with it. Um, and, you know, um, so that's both a perversion of this and, like uh, um, giving allegiance to something like this when what's actually happening is, is different. And I see that I'm out of time, so I'll have, there's a few more things I want to talk about, but I'll talk about it next time. Let's go ahead and do it. Okay.